Okay, um, I'm going to start with actually a very simple introduction to Ansible. So I'm just going to assume that while people here might have experience with either sysadmin stuff or DevOps, that they've pretty much never done, you know, dealt with Ansible itself before. So we'll be covering the extreme basics, not including installation, because installation is pip install Ansible, you're done. Alternatively, app get install Ansible, yum install Ansible, or pacman install Ansible, whatever. You know your own distros, that's how you install it. Ansible currently does not support Windows as a controller, so don't try and run it on Windows like 99.9% .9 of things written in Python. Okay, so Ansible itself, quite simple. It's basically two things in one. If you ever use Chef and Puppet for provisioning, it does that. If you use Fabric for deployment, it does that too. The difference between this and, say, Fabric is Fabric is very, tell me what to do and I will do it. So you tell it to copy a file, it copies a file. You tell it to create a file, it creates a file. With Ansible, it's more declarative. You say, I want a file to exist here. It makes sure that the file is there. So similarly, you won't say install this package, you will say ensure that this package is installed, right? And so that's a slight difference in thinking. Um, it's quite similar to Salt as well. Salt does the same thing. So let's start with a few demos. Um, let's make sure that the machines that we're hitting are alive. Okay. So um, Ansible, the command, simple. Now the all comes from this. I have a host file here with four instances running on my laptop because I was bored. Um, this host file basically declares every single server that you have, be it a production server, testing server, staging server, does not matter, you define everything here. And then you put it into the same groups. In this case, I, didn't have, I don't have a distinction between say staging and production. I just have a web server that is um, ANS0, a VPN server that's ANS1, a VOIP server that's ANS2, and all four of these are under another group called Arch. Um, essentially, servers themselves will be the first four, and I put them into groups called, well, whatever their name is, mostly because I can't be asked to keep typing .local everywhere. Usually, you will use this when you have multiple servers that always have the same config. Let's say you have something sharded across two machines and it will always be sharded, um, or rather replicated on the same two machines, you can always put them in the same group. There is nothing stopping me from, say, doing an ens4.local down here. Both will now count as ns3. Children in the header just means that this group has groups in it and not actually hosts. One limitation is you cannot mix hosts and groups. Last I checked, uh, though there have been two major point updates since then, so I'm not sure. But the last time I tried, if I did this, it didn't work. So we won't try it, because. And the other advantage of groups is you can have the same machine or the same um, subgroups belong to other groups, which lets you do quite fun stuff. So you might wonder why I have a group here called Arch. Well, that's quite simple. Because I now have a group variable, a set of group variables, basically variables that any host in this group will inherit when I run anything with Ansible. And uh, I set the Python interpreter to Python 2. I have to do this on Arch because Arch is Python 3 by default. And they don't like old things. But the rest of the world does because we like stability. And we are too lazy to update our packages apparently, so these poor guys at uh, Ansible Works had to support all the way back to Python 2.6 thanks to our dear friends using CentOS. And so that gives you group variables. Uh, other than group variables, you also have host variables. So you could create a folder here and call it host underscore vars. You could do a lot of other fun stuff. And I just, okay, uh, there we go. So basically there's a very interesting structure to this, which might be easier if I just used sublime text to show you guys. So generally just pay attention to the left side. You'll notice our group variables, playbooks, roles, and a bunch of YAML files, right? Oh, yes? Uh, you're not supposed to look at that text, it's okay. I'm only pointing out the left side, which I can't enlarge the size of. Yeah, so you have those guys. Now, back to Vib so I can actually, you guys can actually read, right? 
Um, let's work our way from the bottom up. A very simple thing you can do with Ansible is, like I did, ran a ping command, which pings all the machines. It's not actually an ICMP echo ping. What this does is it SSHs a file, SCPs a file rather, over and make sure that the correct file is there. So there's checksumming, all kinds of fun stuff happening. Basically, it's a simple sanity check to make sure that your Ansible <coughs> stuff runs on your target machines. So, you know, it makes sure that you have SSH installed, you have Python 2 installed, and you have the interpreter set correctly, which you don't have to do in most distros. If you don't have any of these, your ping will fail. If your hosts are down, your ping will also fail. And so let's look at this command, right? Let's go down to the basics. All. All is a sort of reserved keyword, wherein it basically is a master group containing every single host you defined in the host file. Normally, you would have to do something like dash i uh, host to pass it like, oh, this is my inventory file every single time. Alternatively, if you're lazy and or sane, you could just do export ansible hosts equals whatever, wherever your host file is. Um, let's not confuse people. If you're using bash or dash or C shell or any other shell, it would be that. In my case, I'm not running any of those shells, so it's a bit different. Yeah. Okay. Now, back to this command again. So dash m ping. Dash m in Ansible generally means module. So here we're at using the ping module, which doesn't really have any options, so you could run it and it would ping all your machines. Um, I have a dash F4 at the end. Uh, I can't remember what F actually stands for. There is you know, a long version of it, but basically it's parallelism. By setting it to four, it runs on four machines at a time. Doesn't make much difference when I'm pinging them, makes a very big difference if I'm doing, say, a Pac-Man install or something. Now, obviously there are other modules. Uh, there's a happy module called shell, where you could tell it to Echo, yay, and obviously it doesn't work because I'm supposed to do this. Essentially, when you run Ansible itself, the command, it will gather the std out and std error of whatever process you run, and it will print it out to you. Let me just confirm that it actually does print std error. Yes, so it gives you both standard out and standard error. And if something errors out, it would be red because it failed. So you notice there's a happy failed and a rather a sad failed and a happy past. Uh, you might not be able to see the failed because red on black generally comes out terribly on projectors that are small. So let's try not to make fail too many things along the way. Shell is basically a shell. There is actually a default module which is called command, which is invoked if you don't pass a module. It's kind of a lot like shell, except now you need to do a user bin echo because there is no path. This would work. This would sometimes work and sometimes not, depending on your default path, because it doesn't actually you know, launch a shell. Other fun modules include stuff like um, Pac-Man which I didn't give it anything to do. Let's say I want to say name equals tmux. State equals installed. There you go. There's the other beautiful thing about Ansible is that most commands that you run, barring shell commands and stuff that you're telling it exactly what to do rather than what the outcome is, are idempotent. I could run this command a hundred times, it would make no difference. It will just keep returning the same thing because, well, tmux is already installed. Why should I install it again? Same way you can add, you can say, uh, I can't remember whether it's uninstalled or is it absent or not present. Might be absent. So there is one rather annoying thing I found about um, Ansible, it's that because the modules are written by different people in the community, the syntax is not exactly the most consistent thing. 
for stuff like um, I, one example is that when you're using yum it's not state equals installed it's state equals present or something like that whereas when you're using pacman it's state equals installed and if you're trying to write distro agnostic stuff this can be very very infuriating because you will end up doing stuff like oh god why is this not working because you, tr you managed to write the code to automatically select the module based on the distro but you forgot that the second part's different too so there's a lot of stuff that's distro specific which is why I created group virus arch everything arch will be here so let's say I wanted to uh, have something like packager equals pack okay it's called it. packager pacman and installed state installed then later on I would be able to do fun stuff like um, so your stuff is written in the Jinja2 templating syntax, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, it's If you've done anything with Flask, you will know it very well. If you've done anything with Django, it should be immediately familiar because it's quite similar in syntax with a few quirks here and there. And that is it for that. So most of the config is done in YAML files, dear little YAML files. So you have, in this case, I have common site, VOIP, VPN, and triple W. Most of them would tell you exactly what to do. Site.yaml is actually um, part of Ansible best practices. Your main file is supposed to be called site for some obscure reason. So what this does is I just include the other four in. So if I ran right now, say, Ansible uh, playbook, site.yaml this would run every single thing I'm not going to run this right now because it's extremely slow and it does a lot of things so this would basically be a shorthand to run everything now if most of your stuff is done and you just want to set up say VPN you just do vpn.yaml if most of the stuff is done and you need triple W well you do that common in my case is just a bunch of you know common config because there are certain things that you can't configure within a playbook like the user it runs as for example you can't have, say, I have a playbook, I want one role to run as uh, root, one role to run as my user. Well, you can't do that. So in this case, everything is run as my user with sudo. And um, Ansible, obviously, being an automation tool, does not like being asked for passwords. So make sure, step one, that you have SSH um, keys enabled. Make sure, number two, that if you are running it as a user other than root, that your sudo does not require a password because you will basically be wasting a lot of time and making our Ansible playbooks really, really ugly. If this means that you need to have like a 521-bit ECDSA key for your SSH just to make it secure, go ahead, it's worth it. And uh, well, in common, um, these are the two things that I want all my machines to have. I want all of them to have the development role, which I'll go into in a bit, and the SSH role. Obviously, you want to be able to SSH into a machine, and therefore you want to be you want the SSH to be configured the way you want it to be. And the second thing I run is here, you'll notice I run this as my user without sudo. And the reason this is kind of important is because it will, this is this environment role that you see at the bottom. It sets up stuff like my dot files, my vimrc, and I don't want these files owned by root because it'll be really, really annoying to set them up later. So I run these as my user. Um, this is actually, um, I removed it from my playbook long, long time ago. I put it back in so I could show you guys. You can declare variables in here randomly. So I could say have a vars, and uh, this is a standard YAML hash, something like that. These will, so you would be able to access test as a variable anywhere in your playbook. Um, variables have a global namespace, so do watch out for naming conflicts. Don't do lame slash fun slash stupid things where in your roles themselves you use SSH as a variable and then here you use SSH as a variable. They will clobber and it will just, it will start using random values in random places and you will hate yourself for ever having done that. Vars prompt on the other hand, what it does is when you run this playbook, it will prompt you for a value. If you set private to yes, it will not echo it back to the terminal. If you don't set anything or set it to no, it will echo it back as per normal. I'm going to remove this because it's no longer used in my scripts. Right. 
So that's common. There's also site.yaml, which includes everything which I went through. BOIP has one primary role that is murmur. There is a vast prompt here again, which is actually still in use, and it prompts me for a passphrase for my Mumble server. Mumble is a you know, group BOIP thing that people use when they realize how bad Skype is. Similarly, there's VPN, which just sets up the VPN servers, and there's Triple W, which sets up multiple roles. So it sets up Nginx, it sets up, it transfers my SSL certs, it then sets up the Nginx sites themselves. I keep these separate for a reason. The idea is your Nginx is common config across all machines you ever admin, mostly. And the sites will configure the various you know, site-specific things which you might want to add, remove, whatever. I also set up Uwiski in Emperor mode, and later on there are also playbooks around, at least in my repo, for deploying a particular app. Okay, let's go down into playbooks, because playbooks is quite simple. This is not a role. This is a very, very simple one-file playbook, and all it does is actually generate you secure SSH keys. <laughs> A uh, simple example, you give it a name, you run it on every single host by default. You can always limit this when you are running it. I want it run as my user with sudo as usual. Tasks to do, there are two main tasks here. One is to delete the old SSH keys because most VPS services will either generate it when the machine first boots up and has extremely low entropy, which is not exactly a good idea. Or they might be like DigitalOcean and have uh, an issue where the Debian thing just has the same SSH key for everyone, which is not fun. So you just generate new SSH keys. Um, both of these are shell commands because it's a very simple script. Technically, I could uh, use a file glob and say I want all these files to be state equals absent, but NRM is just one line, it's quicker. And you don't really care that it's that important because it, the files are going to be there when you're done with running this. The next thing is to generate the SSH keys themselves. Again, you just use it from the shell. Now, this thing is really interesting. So you see Notify here. What Notify does is if you give it a string, in this case, restart SSH, which makes perfect sense if you know exactly what it does by looking at it, it's not actually magic. It looks under handlers for something called restart SSH. And because it's an exact string match, it runs this thing, which then calls service. A service is a really, really smart module that they have in Ansible, unlike like 80% of the other modules. It knows whether you're running something with init.d, whether you're running something with upstart and therefore you can use service, or whether you're running systemd and so you can use systemctl. Unfortunately, uh, the systemd implementation broke a while ago. I don't think anyone's fixed it, so I've just gone back to using shell for it. In this case... The system D yeah, systemd doesn't work anymore. Yeah, you have to like shell, system CTL, restart, SSHD. But if things worked properly the way they should, which definitely will happen once RHEL 7 is out because that is, you know, actually moving things forward for once. And so I'm looking for the service named SSHD, state restarted, so I want it restarted, and I want it enabled on boot. And you might be wondering why it says restarted and not restart. The reason for that is if you have 10 separate guys who all notify restart SSH, it will wait until all 10 are done and then just restart SSH once. It won't do stupid things like I have 10 playbooks that want to restart SSH <coughs> and then I run all 10 tasks and then it just restarts every time. No, it doesn't do that. It will restart SSH after whatever you tell it to. And there's also another task in here which is to fetch the new SSH host keys because how else do you know that you're SSHing into the correct machine? You might be leaking information. So in this case, it's quite simple. Don't really need sudo. I fetch a file. So fetch is another Ansible module which pulls data from the server to you. There's an, obviously a module that pushes files over. And you give it the, you give it the source, which is etc ssh, ssh host, item key. The, the reason there's item there is because I want both the RSA and the ECDSA key. If you're not using Fedora or Arch, you will probably only have the RSA key, so it's fine. But the rest of us have, things, have to do things like this. And destination, I want it in TMP, new host keys, slash, Ansible underscore hostname. This is one of those magic variables that appears out of nowhere. Anything prefixed with Ansible underscore typically is like sort of, they give it to you. So try not to name your variables Ansible underscore something because you will probably conflict. And then we clean up, which is to, you know, nuke stuff. And then we 
find the fingerprints, stick it into a file so that I have something happily in my home directory which has the fingerprints of every single server. At which point I can then SSH, check if the key matches, if it matches, say yes and carry on with my day. If it doesn't match, say no and then find out who, who's trying to pull a man in the middle attack. That was a very simple thing. Now we go into roles. Roles are basically meant for meant to be completely reusable. The idea is you could have, you know, roles that you have in say one repo, in another repo, in a third repo. You can just stick it all together in one place, and then your various actual playbooks like the site.yaml, the voip.yaml would then define these roles. And this is exactly how you would set up a dependency. I remember there was a question on the uh, the Facebook group about dependencies. And the thing is, there is no strict dependency orders or anything of that sort in Ansible. The concept simply does not exist. The idea is, you cr if you really need to do step A before step B, um, you would then do something like what I did in this file, where you make sure Nginx is installed here before installing the sites for Nginx, because otherwise you, know, you might be in for a bad day. <coughs> so your whole dependency thing is just purely linear order. Obviously, if you have circular dependency somewhere in your system, you can always set it up so that it installs stuff, does not start it, it installs all the other stuff, and then you have a notify somewhere in the way because a no all notifies are batched and run at the end of the whole process. Now we have see a uh, bunch of roles. Simple one would be development, and uh, this would be where we do this. So there are a bunch of standard folders in Ansible, and this is by convention. If you want to change it, you'll probably have to patch Ansible itself. What it, the two most common ones that you'll pretty much always need are tasks and variables. Tasks, uh, and yes, you do have to name it main.yaml. It's not that I'm bad at naming. This just has a list of tasks. You put your task in here, and then you put your variable in bars slash main.yaml and yeah so this is the list of packages that I have let's say I want to install base devil python2 python htop tmux and tree because I can't live without these things so I just have a variable file with these variables and what the <coughs> task itself does is it iterates over the items in the variable called packages then uses the pacman module says here this package name for every package I want it installed, and I want the latest version. So if you're familiar with uh, Pac-Man, this will be doing an SY, SSY. Yeah, it's actually an SY followed by an SS. S -S. What? Just SY. Yeah, SY. Um, so it would update and then, no, because it doesn't install as well, right? So it's an SY followed by an S, S. no, S, yeah, whatever. SY, S. Yeah, SY. Basically, the idea is if you were using something like Ubuntu, it would be an app get update followed by an app get install. Or yum update followed by yum install, but yum update doesn't actually do that, so it's yum something something which I can never remember and I have to look yeah, up. Yum. Yeah, uh, yum is horrible, but sometimes you have to live with it for reasons. So, yes, uh, I would definitely like to use Ansible as much as possible to make my life with yum better. Anyway, um, so that settles the issue of this one. There's only tasks and var, so it's a very simple role, and I mean, it takes you, what, 10 minutes to write if you have the documentation. Speaking of documentation, um, this page. Learn to love this page. It's a listing of every single Ansible module and uh, documentation for every single Ansible module. I think it's a bit stupid to put it all on one page, but at least you can, like, command F, yum. There you go, you have yum. And with yum, okay, that's, that might have been too big. Is that yum? No, that's you, alright. We need to find yum again. <coughs> okay, there you go. So you can now manage your CentOS packages or your RGL packages or your scientific Linux packages if you're into that stuff. And you can always do horrible things like disable GPG checking, for example, which Pac-Man will simply never let you do and will yell at you uh, unless you go and do it in the conf file. And of course, everyone's favorite en enable repo because what packages does the base repo have again? Like four things other than this kernel? Yep, and so you, you know, here it would be state, and you'll notice it's state equals present and not installed. Mm -hmm. Welcome to hell with Ansible, but you know, it's 
let's just say that the the whole Ansible thing is designed to have a bunch of machines, a bunch of minions under your control that are all the same. If every single minion was different, it would be a nightmare to manage them, Speci you know, especially automated management of them. So if you're writing a bunch of th services that, you know, if you're writing an Ansible playbooks for a bunch of services that run on CentOS, well, you use Yum. You don't introduce an Arch machine into the middle of a CentOS cluster. That's probably not a good idea, even if you don't use Ansible. So they never actually cared about that case. But yes, I would like to see this fixed. It is very annoying. Now, back to fun stuff. Um, let's see, which is a more complex rule over here? Huh, Murmur. Murmur is the mumble daemon. You will see I have handlers now and I have templates. This is where the Jinja2 templating comes in. So let's just look at the vars because they're simple. I tell it the port, I tell it where I want my SQLite DB, my bit rate, max number of users, message of the day, whether to use a snake oil certificate, and my actual certs and key. Um, obviously, these are put in there by the SSL playbook, so they will be somewhere else. And now the two things you guys have not seen yet. Handlers are basically just the same things as handlers uh, from earlier, except you put it in a separate file. And you have templates, murmur.ini, there you go. Um, unfortunately, it seems it's coming up in red, so you may not be able to see it. Is that better? No, that's worse, isn't it? Okay, basically, you put stuff in a double curly brace, and it substitutes <coughs> in variables. That's all you need to know. It's very nice, it's very simple. And you can also do ifs, uh, which I think I have somewhere. Actually, I do have it here. If not murmur.ssl.snakeoil. So basically, if I'm not using the snake oil cert, here is my real cert and my real key. If not, mumble by default will just generate a cert for you and like, yep, here's a snake oil cert. If you're not familiar with the term snake oil cert, it's a self-signed cert that is just completely useless in general, unless you don't really care about you know, security in that case. Other than this, we have OpenVPN, SSL. Okay, SSL is fun. So there's also fun stuff that you can do with this. With You also see files here, which is, you know, it contains files. Like, oh, look, my SSL keys. Except they're encrypted, so it wouldn't really help you to steal this repo. Now, if you look at the tasks, this one's a rather complex one, probably one of the more complex ones that um, is part of my base package and not relating to application deployment, because deployment is really, really messy, and there's no way around it. So you just write one really good Ansible thing for it, and you just leave it alone. So I copy the SSL certs with the copy command, name, obvious. Give it the source, give it the destination, both of which come from variables. I want it owned by root, and I don't want other people to be writing to it. Now, when it comes to keys, obviously you don't you want to source control your whole Ansible library, but you don't want your keys to be just sitting there for anyone to take because that is probably the worst security practice in the existence of mankind. So what I do here is I run a local action. Local action is another module which runs something on the machine you're running Ansible on. So if I were to do if whatever happens here will actually run on my machine. So here I'm telling it to use the shell module. Open SSL, decrypt, blah, 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 blah. All it does is decrypt my keys with this particular file glob, which is a variable. And then we copy the SSL keys over because they have been decrypted. Herp, derp, 0600 because. And then you clean up your local things again with the local action. So at this point, basically, the only time there was ever an, an unencrypted key on your disk was for a few seconds. If you're doing this on an untrusted machine, don't because you should not be having your SSL keys on an untrusted machine in the first place, right? So assuming trusted machine and it's not on your disk for very long, it is kind of safe. Obviously, if there is an error during the copy stage, it will never actually get to the cleanup stage. So you will have an SSL key on your machine, which is why I say don't do it on a machine you don't trust. You don't walk into your friend's office and be like, hey, can I use your machine to like Ansible my machine? Well, for one, how are you actually logging in? SSL, SSH keys, you know? And the last step I do is I copy Nginx's SSL config over. It, some people like to put this 
just like, oh my god, it's Nginx's config, it should be with the SSL. But then you need to find a way to transfer variables across playbooks, which pretty much means you have to move up the hierarchy and put it in the outside playbook, which has no business knowing where the SSL keys are. So I do everything in here. If it's SSL related, it probably goes here. Uh, you, will, you would notice that there's a small violation of that in the mumble thing, but never mind about that. So here, yes? So you ran it first, right, and say yes. it out. Yes. And I, I presume it's kind of like um, a set option, error exit, bash, right? So at the end, it just says, ah, OK, it gives up halfway through the script. Yep. Um, is there all high so you can just run it again? You can just run it again. Okay. I will run a couple of these things afterwards and show you how it goes. <coughs> it's a lot like files. You give it source, destination. It just runs shit. It's quite simple. And I think that is all the interesting playbooks I have. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff here, like a sample Uwiski app, which I guess we can look at because it's different from the others. Um, yes, you in ensure packages are installed, you ensure the Nginx config itself is in place, you ensure that the project repo is up to date. So there's a Git module, which this bit will basically cover most of your deployment needs. You have Git. You give it repo, you give it destination folder, you give it revision. So this version thing is a bit weird because I'm not sure why it's called version because it can be a branch, it can be head, it can be a commit. Obviously you don't want head because that's stupid. You probably want it set to master or deploy or whatever your deployment branch is. Then you make sure the Python packages are installed because we're all Python developers, so we use pip. Our dear pip has a module as well. And most importantly, the you know absolutely essential virtual env support. So you can give it a virtual environment, you tell it the requirements file, it will install everything for you. So it just looks in there and does the usual things. And the last step is I put a symlink in place, which will basically ensure that Emperor mode picks up on this guy and runs it. Now, let's run a few of these things. Um, I have not actually run these in a very long time, so I'm not sure if any of them, or rather I've not run these on these particular machines at hand recently, so things might break. Uh, worst case scenario, I will just demo against my own server, which I would prefer not to, but. Let's say we run triple W. The other thing about Ansible is that if you have Kausei installed, and if you're not familiar with what Kausei is, uh, <laughs> Kausei Moo makes Kausei Moo. And if you have Kausei installed, or as I like to call it, if you have made the mistake of having Kausei installed, Ansible will use Kausei for all its messages. You'll be seeing a lot of cows, you'll learn to love your cows. And before the obvious joke comes, no, the guy who wrote it is not Hindu. So in this case, um, I asked it to prompt me for the decryption password because, well, it's decrypting it locally, isn't it? So I key in my password, it decrypts it, and you'll notice that a lot of text is in yellow because it is actually... Uh, okay, that's cool. That should be Shansik. What? That should be Shansik. Never mind. Yes, uh, there's a lot of small little stuff here. Anyway, most of the text is, uh, is yellow because this is being run against machines who have not had this done. So the state has changed. It managed to do this, it managed to do that, then it threw a giant warning at me somewhere down here because um, I most of my playbooks were written back in the old syntax days where it was dollar open curly brace, but now they've deprecated that and it's double curly brace on both sides. So a lot of my repo is still in the process of transition. There's that stuff. Then you have all the stuff that's transferred and then a giant error at the end, which says that it could not create var triple w is trans sick. Chances are the var triple w folder doesn't actually exist. That's why this is happening. Because like a genius, I forgot to put in the thing to say, you should probably create this folder. And so it didn't do it. Um, I'm not going to bother retrying this because we're just going to get the same error. But if I do retry it, you will notice that a lot of the output will be green. Because it will, it will check that Nginx is installed, and Nginx will be installed. It will check that the SSL key has been transferred, and the SSL key has been transferred. In this case, the key is always transferred again. Because... 
So most of these things didn't run again because I'd import them, except this one step because the key is decrypted locally, which means the modification time always changes and the file create time always changes, which means it's always copied over. But it's an SSL key, it's fine if this happens. For most of the you know more expensive things like installing packages and all that, it doesn't do it multiple times. It will only do it once and it just says, yep, okay, this is new, this is new, this is done. Let's try something else, maybe this would work. Uh, laziness leads to simple passwords like hello. Uh, it's going to try and install it. In the meantime, I ran this thing. You'll notice that the host is not all, the host says VOIP. What that does is it looks inside here, looks for VOIP which is here, and then installs it only on the machine that requires VOIP, which is this guy. No one else has it. <coughs> which also means that given the way I've currently set up my things, it will not actually work in the long run. Installing Murma takes a while because it's a giant package. And in the meantime, we can take a look at, let's see, OpenVPN, for example. Again, same stuff. In this case, I actually have two separate things because I have a, my machine runs two VPNs. So there's two bits of config for it. And you'll notice that here, the notify is restart, which means that I would probably have fixed it. Handler's main, there you go. So because the service module didn't work with system CTL, I had to use the shell module and do it manually, which is not fun at all, but such is the way of things. Um, if I get bored enough someday, I'll probably end up writing the module to handle system D because why the hell not? Clearly hasn't been done yet for some reason, but you will never know why people didn't do something until you attempt it and fail. And that's the best way to learn. Uh, yes, it's taking very long to install Murmur. Ansible. Well, they're all alive. That's good news. Can you kill your ant, your uh, murmur build, and then your murmur install, and then uh, do additional debug to show what's doing? Yes, you can. You can basically add up to five Vs, which will then start printing out every single thing. You can see the exact command that it executes, which is currently terrible. Um, let's see. <coughs> Well, actually, I know what to do. I was being stupid. The simple way to, for me to fix this would be to... Just give me a moment while I fix this. Yep, white terminals, better for presenting. There you go, it successfully did it. And if you were bored enough, you would notice that it's running a bunch of SSH commands with what is essentially a Python script that's being transferred over. So the way this thing works and the reason that there are no dependencies unlike salt and everything else is all it does is take libraries, build Python script, SSH Python script over, execute Python script which is why it has no dependencies, right? All you need is Python 2 and SSH because that's exactly all it uses. Anything else just bundles it into the file for you. If we go up to, if we go up to the bits where it's actually transferring files, you might notice SCP sometimes, but basically with this many Vs, you can see exactly what is happening. And it also gives you like nice little information like, oh, it changed and the blank item changed and it installed one package. Brilliant. Here, for example, you will see that it added a file, quite obviously, which is actually the config file from earlier, from somewhere. What is going on here? Okay, never mind. And 
that is pretty much it for the basic introductions. I mean, I will probably post a link to my GitHub repo once I clean up this stuff where you can go and poke around with these files. I will obviously remove the SSL cert despite it being encrypted because who knows where you know decryption thing goes like five days from now. But yes, uh, if you have any questions, now will be the time. What is one of the file Python scripts look like they're sending across or generate Python scripts? It goes into TMPFS and then it likes to delete it. So you would have to somehow kill the process before it manages to. You can like, uh, uh, drop your murmur, delete your murmur again, and control Z it halfway through, and then just examine. See what it looks like. Is it sending like, a, a whole like, polycraft across, or is it something uh, small, sweet, and terse? Let's see, that was answerable to. This is the Ansible Python module that it transferred over. And there are... Uh, 1,243 lines in just the, Py the Pac-Man module. This is not even the whole script. Yeah, yeah. So yes, stuff is pretty big, but it generally likes to cache it. So it's not quite that bad. It's not as... Um, efficient as salt would be but again salt also has a very strict master and slave uh, config whereas with ansible you can either do push config like i've been doing all this time or you can have the nodes pull or you can do something where like you push to one node and you have that node push it to all the other nodes so you could have a cluster with say a controller and you just push the new config to the controller who pushes it out to all the little nodes that are uh, Happy about it. What's your Ansible version uh, on your local machine? My Ansible version. Ansible version. Dash dash. Uh, I need local. to switch to the next machine. Yeah. yeah. One four one. <coughs> Any other questions? People normally ask how it compares to other stuff, but I think I went through that briefly at the start. Yes. I understand that I, and I've not really had to deploy uh, mm -hmm. many machines yet, but if you want to do firewall settings on many machines, can you do that? Yep. If I'm not wrong, there is an IP tables module. Okay. Um, not sure if there's a PF module. There should be because they have been like really beefing up their PS <coughs> support these days. And personally, this repo that of mine is all the Ansible scripts for just one VPS of mine. So even though I don't use it to administer multiple machines, it still has value because most people, as Patrick likes to say, are sticky to VPS providers. Let's say you sign up on AWS, you set up your instance after like two weeks, you don't want to move because how your config is stuck there and you need to copy everything. In my case, if you want me to deploy a new instance like tomorrow and switch VPS providers, sure. I just run one command, it would be like, Ansible, uh, playbook, <coughs> site.yaml, enter. And it would just set up my system exactly the way I want it from scratch, assuming my SSH key was there, of course. It's particularly useful if you have, uh, say, a local cluster that you set up using KVM, Zen, whatever you choose, because then you have full control over both the, the base image, where you can ensure that, you know, public keys and everything are in there, and your Ansible config, which customizes that machine to its role. Can you get the output back in some sort of like, like JSON or some sort of programmatic form? Uh, can you get the output back in JSON? Um, was there, yes, was you can. Was there no reason to do that? You can get the output back as JSON trivially for stuff that you run on the command line. Okay. If you want it back as uh, for like a playbook, you cannot launch it from the command line. Obviously, you'll have to use their um, libraries. Oh, so they have libraries for scripting this. If you'd like to, you know, maybe provide a web interface to someone to do it. Okay. 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 So thanks, Rahul.